Liverpool today is a truly modern city and a success story of the highest order. In 2018 alone, the city welcomed 67 million visitors in a tourism industry worth 4.6 billion pounds annually. The city, thanks to its history as an Atlantic trade hub and breeding ground for some of the world's best music groups, is home to the International Slavery Museum, the Beatles Museum, Liverpool and Everton FC, and a plethora of good shopping and great food and drink. Over the last decade plus, Liverpool has returned to its perch as one of the jewels of Great Britain. While the city thrives today, its outlook wasn't always so rosy. It has been described as the city of harder times to come, with worries of economic, political, and social decay never far from mind. However, to understand the city, its struggles, its attempts at salvation, and its ultimate re-emergence, we need a little bit of background. Liverpool, unlike most of the famed cities of Britain, is not a medieval city. The oldest parts of the city's fabric date from only the 18th century. This comparative youth makes the city's depth of history all the more impressive. In all truth, the city as we know it was a child of the Atlantic Ocean's triangular trade and the Industrial Revolution. Its title as Second Port of England brought great wealth to the city and with that, architectural wonders. The first of these are the Albert Docks, built in 1846. A stately array of five dock buildings, this area was long the hub of one of the world's busiest ports. The result of Liverpool's relative youth was their departure from traditional English Gothic architecture and an affinity for the Greek Revival style, perhaps best shown here in St. George's Hall. The hall was built to handle the growing population, wealth, and demand for public spaces. Holding a performance hall and courts of law, the hall quickly became a Liverpool institution. Lastly here is the most iconic collection of buildings on Merseyside. Known as the Three Graces for the beauty they hold alongside the port are the Liver, the Cunard, and the Port Liverpool buildings. All built in the early 1900s for an insurance company, a cruise liner, and port administration, they have since become inseparable from the city and an ever-present reminder of the city's once great wealth. As the 20th century progressed, however, the city's fortunes soon began to change, beginning with World War II. As war fell across Europe in 1939, Liverpool's power as a port and shipbuilding town, home of both the Titanic and the Lusitania, ensured they caught the eye of Germany's Luftwaffe bombers. Merseyside was the primary target in England outside of London. The region suffered 68 destructive air raids between August of 1940 and May of 1941. The buildings damaged in the raids constituted a full historical register of iconic structures. The combination of Liverpool's working class roots, particularly in the Everton neighborhood, and the bomb damage from the Second World War left much to be desired in the city's housing stock and residential areas. But that desire may have existed only within the city leadership and not in the hearts of the residents. Ken Rogers, Everton native, former sports writer for the Liverpool Echo, and author of The Lost Tribe of Everton and Scotland Road, described his experiences of growing up poor on Melbourne Lane. You might have had backyards, smelling back entries and rats. You might have lacked bathrooms and hot running water. You might have had outside lavatories, with strips of the Liverpool Echo newspaper hanging on a piece of string. Living conditions in Everton's Victorian Terrace housing were certainly not what we would call modern and arguably bordered on being hospitable. But as Ken continued, Yes, many houses were lacking in basic amenities, but we didn't feel deprived or ashamed because of where we lived. Rather, we felt supremely proud to be part of communities where doors were generally always open and where neighbors looked out for each other. To be from Everton or Scotty Road was a badge of honor wherever you went in the world. Despite the community's contentment with the way things were, the city council pushed on, commissioning Graham Shankland to outline a new Liverpool. Shankland and the planning commission designated two-thirds of the city center as obsolete and in need of redevelopment. The plan was built around one core principle, to remake Liverpool into a modern city. Shankland's radical proposal for how to make it happen was the total separation of, quote, motor and man. The city would be rebuilt vertically, with tall buildings, elevated motorways, parking garages, and walkways in the sky. Population and existing industry and warehousing would be jettisoned to the suburbs in favor of high-rent offices and commercial areas. As shown in the maps, the city center becomes a lighter brown, indicating a lower population density. In addition, as seen in the blue areas, the city's shopping would be consolidated into the city center. Pedestrian-focused public spaces would also be a key part of the new urban fabric. As we also see on these maps, limited access motorways became far more prominent in the new city structure. A key feature of the new city would be an inner motorway. 
motorway would frame the city center and link directly with new high office buildings and parking garages. Zell had the ultimate goal of moving traffic off of the street level to improve flows, along the addition of flyovers to get suburban liver Republicans in the Mersey River tunnels without having to navigate the city. These changes were seen by the Planning Commission as basic requirements of a modern, automobile-friendly city. Another focal point of the Shanklin plan was on public outdoor space. The city of Liverpool had only 20% of the recommended open acreage for its population, and the Planning Commission was set on resolving this as part of its motor and man separation. The shaded areas on these maps clearly show the lack of existing public areas in contrast with the deliberate and substantial increase in communal space built into Shanklin's plan. Two key sites for these public spaces would be the new commercial development at Strand and Paradise Streets, seen here before redevelopment, with a six and a half acre park at the top of parking garage, and the new city government complex in the shielded open space from municipal events and public meetings. All of this bright-eyed optimism about what could be done for Liverpool with comprehensive redevelopment wasn't just theoretical. Shanklin, the Planning Commission, the City Council, and the National Ministry for Housing and Development had some bold ideas to make it happen. First, as was common in the U.S., just with a different name, was the Council and Ministry's powers of compulsory purchase. This would allow the purchase of multiple contiguous plots of land to create the large-scale developments and change in vision. Also, this plan was not meant to continue in perpetuity. Shanklin saw his plan as best served by being mostly completed by 1981. As part of this, he set out two tranches of development activities, 1971 and 1976. The first set, to be done by 1971, were projects underway or fundamental to the greater redevelopment. Then, in 1976, came the more logistically complicated projects that helped complete the city's transformation. The map seen here showed the scale of what the city hoped to accomplish in just a decade, with all the colored areas indicating some form of redevelopment. Shingon's plan wasn't short on big ideas. It seemed to have reasonable methods to implement it on at least some meaningful scale. That, however, turned out not to be the case as the plan virtually dissolved after only a few projects were completed and the city fell further into economic, political, and social decay. Let us first begin with a few projects that were completed, albeit with varying degrees of success. Liverpool grew as a city because of its port on the River Mersey. This also means it is separated from much of its suburban area and requires transport on or under the Mersey. The Birkenhead Tunnel was built in the early 1930s, but with car traffic increasing, was no longer sufficient. Thus, a second tunnel, the Wallsey, seen here being constructed, was included in the city's 1965 plan. That tunnel and its access roads took a particular toll on Scotland Road. Large parts of Scotland Road and its legendary collection of pubs were leveled to create space for the tunnel ramps. However, the tunnel remains in use today and has a key transport route between Liverpool and the Royal Peninsula. One of Liverpool's oldest commercial institutions was St. John's Market, a public market in operation since 1812. Shanklin sought to transform and expand the market into St. John's Precinct, a modern indoor and destination shopping center. While it was completed and opened by Queen Elizabeth II in 1971, the results failed to live up to the idea. The precinct faltered in an economically struggling city and fell into disrepair over the decades. It had to undergo a series of costly renovations in recent years to remain functional. Hague, Canterbury, and Crosby Heights were three council housing tower blocks built in Everton as part of the move to a modern, vertical city. Replacing tight-knit communities of terrace homes with 14-story concrete blocks was always going to be difficult, but the results here were remarkably dismal. Nicknamed the Piggeries, the appalling construction and little concern for tenant health quickly turned them into slums. Tenant staged a rent strike in the 1970s in protest, and the towers were eventually demolished in the 1980s after standing for barely 20 years. The Shanklin Plan ran into problems both local and global all amplified by Liverpool's unique history. The first problem is unsurprisingly funding. Starting in 1973, the city's property bubble burst. This meant the rising prices and taxes counted on to finance the ongoing redevelopment work disappeared. Energy to get the work done soon followed. Much of the work already started, scars of unfinished rubble-strewn sites were left covering the city. Economic conditions were the second major obstacle. In the decade from 1961 to 1971, the city lost 75,000 workers a full 19% of its workforce. This was largely due to the decline of the docks and the unrealized promises by both Shanklin and the national government of new industry coming to the city. As just mentioned, the decline of the docks was a key factor in the city's mass unemployment. That precipitous decline came from two distinct sources. The first of these was containerization. 
shipping containers revolutionized maritime trade and made redundant the massive Dockland workforces that had long sustained Liverpool. Secondly, it was England's turn towards Europe. Liverpool was the country's main Atlantic port and had been the hub for England's trade routes to Africa, Asia, and the Americas. But as the European Union grew and the United Kingdom joined in 1973, that business moved to the country's southeast as the Channel ports became the nation's trade hubs. Britain's turn to Europe may have been the true death knell for Liverpool. Other European ports like Hamburg, Rotterdam, and Antwerp faced struggles with containerization, but none anywhere near as severe as Liverpool's. Merseyside's reliance on the Atlantic in a post-Atlantic era of trade left it redundant and relegated, and doomed Shanklin's plan for a vibrant, modern city. While it would be overly harsh to pin the blame for Liverpool's demise and the failures of the Shanklin plan, it would be equally wrong to completely exonerate it. The physical and social destruction of tightly knit communities, especially those in the terraced houses of Everton, pulled at the threads of the city's social fabric. Then, as the docks failed and the British government turned its back on Liverpool, that fabric ripped, leaving scraps of a once great city. Thankfully, for the Republicans, Britons, and the world, those scraps are finally being stitched back together into the amazing city Liverpool is supposed to be.